let me go. Um, I think pe people who might have this experience that in the book has a certain form. You don't really know what that is when you start writing. Uh, you have an idea what you think it is, and then the form imposes itself on you. And yeah, I mean, I, I, for me, it was a. It's not all joy writing, put it that way. It's, um, you know, there's a labor to it. You know, the, the joy, uh, the excitement is in the, the, the rush of ideas, the, the creative burst, and the labor is in articulating that, um, you know, rewriting a sentence over and over again. Um, so yeah, I felt it was something that, that I had to convey. It was, it was you know, I don't know. It was, my, my life was on standstill until, I, until I'd done that. Um, but yet it, it had its own time scale. So that, you know, I don't think it took 11 years. You know, it's a long time, and I, you know, ideally I would have done it quicker. <laughs> it just, um, I say, it came to its own pace, and I, I felt at the end that it, it had achieved the form that I, I wanted it to be, you know, that I, I intuitively sensed it could be a few years earlier. Um, so I, you know, I'm pleased from that, that point of view. Um, the other question was the uh, divergence, convergence. Uh, whether we're at a point in our revolution where things are, you know, where convergence and synthesis is um, happening, I don't know. And I, I see convergence and synthesis as being um, a corrective to an overemphasis on diversity and fragmentation um, and specialization. So, I mean, again, I, I was fortunate to study in a school in a program where. Uh, Big picture thinking is encouraged, and, and transdisciplinary perspectives are developed. You just you just couldn't do this kind of work at most academic institutions. But I think there is a shift generally now towards you, know, you, you, you see departments in academic institutes um, co cooperating more and more. And so that I think there is uh, you know, a, the beginnings of a, of a movement in that direction. Um, I think maybe. I think it's a, it's a reflection of integral consciousness to um, to see the the unitary background, the, 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 the spirituality of through coming through all things. And in that sense, then it's, there's a, 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 there needs to be a shift to a more towards a unitary vision. Um, any other comment or question? Yeah. Um, were there traditions in? writings about how how astrology could be possible that you drew on or do you feel like you really just were paying attention to your studies and intuiting okay depth psychology that and then and bringing it together did you yeah. have influences in that way that you felt yeah and that's a really good question i um i felt that the, the treatment of the the topic of how planets and how planets could be related to human experience. I felt the treatment of that topic was often neglected, particularly in, in modern astrology. Um, so and one of the reasons I wrote the book, really, was to try and address that, what I saw as a, sh a shortcoming. That, you know, people, particularly in psychological astrology, that there hadn't really been anyone who would, you know, people were using Jung, but using it in a philosophically unsophisticated way. And, and, um, so I, <coughs> I really was drawing on my own need to have an explanation that made more sense to me than ones that were there. Um, I mean, the, the, there's the hermetic maxim of as above, so below, and the idea that the microcosm and macrocosm are, are connected. But for me, even though those ideas were kind of evocative, um, they didn't really, they didn't speak to me. You know, I needed to understand for myself, uh, and I thought others made too, that to understand in, in a, in a more modern language, you know, how how astrology could work. Um, so that's, that's why I, I really I drew on the new paradigm sciences. <coughs> Cam Campbell said, Joseph Campbell said that, um, that um, for the cosmological function of myth, that the, the, the myth needs to be um, in accordance with the science of the time. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the reasons I. I I mean, astrology is not in accordance with the mainstream science of our time, but I, I felt that it, in, the, in the future it could have, it could potentially be in accordance with the new, new paradigm perspectives. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I, I felt I needed to do that. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, this is 
kind of related to Richard's uh, question about differentiation and, and integration, or um, I don't know the Teridian terms, um, but when you were describing the gods getting consolidated into a monotheistic god and that, that <coughs> sort of the death knell of, of the gods, of the poly, polymorphic gods, and <coughs> then science sort of reified that, um, I started to think about differentiation and integration there, and I wonder um, if the solar consciousness, the so, sort of solar monotheistic masculine consciousness that um, took over uh, 2,500 years ago, is on a heroic journey <laughs> So, uh, Where does this book land? <laughs> in the abyss. <laughs> um, At the low point? I mean, I mean, I'm picturing the circle you drew for us in the Camel class, you know, in the heroic journey, you know, and right, there's all right. the stages of the journey. I mean, I, I think, like, like Rick's work, I'm addressing the, the need to um, integrate solar consciousness, as you call it, with uh, lunar, you know, more feminine, to, to, to bring the individual um, self into a, a relationship with the, the ground, the maternal ground of being, to use Jung's term. Um, so I, that's like a, a, a subplot or a sub-theme within the book to, to look at that. I mean, the, last, the last chapter looks at the, uh, the epilogue, looks at the possible symbolic significance of the moon landing, um, where I address those topics. Um, I touch on those topics, at least. So um, it's where my book... I think it just contributes to that. Um, I hope it contributes to that movement towards some kind of um, unification or, or um, yeah, heroes gamos between the, uh, the individual self with the containing ground of being, um, which you know, Jung explores this in detail, particularly in Mysterium Coniunctionis, and the alchemical <coughs> union of the consciousness with the, the unconscious ground. I was really excited to see that you made a correlation between cosmological power and planetary energies. I was curious how, what process you went through, because I learned just recently that um, cosmological powers are, are related to the Jewish tree of life and even the planetary um, assignments to those powers. So I was just curious what process you right. went to to decide on the list you took. Well, I actually, uh, I didn't take cosmological powers to the class during my master's degree, it was all on my list of like classes I really wanted to do, and um, I had to go back early to, to the UK. So I was only here for a year during my master's degree, and it was one of the classes I was supposed to be taking the semester I, I went back. So then I didn't take it then until 2007, I think it was the first year of my PhD. Um, so I, I, mean, I, knew, I knew of Brian's model, but I, I hadn't really looked at the specifics of the different powers. So. Um, it was just natural for me, really, you know, thinking archetypally, thinking in terms of, of astrology, to, to see correlations, I, I, you know, seamlessness and, and, and Neptune, or um, interrelatedness in the moon, and that was a really striking correlation. Um, so I, I, I did um, a paper for Brian in that class on the comparison. I did a presentation with <coughs> another student in the class, Jonah Safer. Um, we did a joint presentation on that, on that topic. So, you know, Brian liked it, and uh, <laughs> he's generally enthusiastic about it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, for me, my, my motivation for doing that was to, to reinforce um, the shift from a psychological conception of archetypes to a cosmological. Um, you know, if a, if a cosmologist could, could see um, discernible powers at work in the processes that shape the universe uh, and that we're sh shaping, still shaping our lives today, then that seemed to me um, you know, just another perspective on the same core principles. You know, that one perspective was coming out of the psychological tradition, depth psychology, and another coming out of cosmology. And I just, I don't, for me, it just, it just the parallels jumped out. And, uh, and it also helped me, as I said, to conceive of individuation and cosmological, as a cosmological process. Any other comments? Yeah, I <coughs> well, <coughs> You know, and, uh, and my uh, endorsements on the book for other people to see how uh, highly I value your um, 
clarity of expression and your ability to uh, uh, take diverse ideas and formulate them in ways that become uh, intelligible to uh, to your reader, um, much in the way Richard uh, was saying. And uh, so I. I'd like to ask you a question that more has to do with something that you you would have. Um, this is more of a sociology of knowledge question that particularly relates to your um, your being uh, from Great Britain and you know, coming out of that and living there uh, now again, coming out of that matrix compared with here. Uh, because these are the two, um, uh, well, certainly in the English-speaking world, um, these are the two kind of major centers of uh, of astrological thinking, and um, there are there's been in here for thirty years such an ease of uh, dialogue among the new paradigm thinkers and the depth psychologists and the astrologers because I mean, we, you know uh, we were all meeting at Esalen and and you know Fritjof Capra and Stan Groff and I taught together in many month long seminars and and you know Fritjof would be getting readings or Rupert Sheldrake and so sort of, sort of all these there's a lot of there's an ease a di the California scene is one in which a kind of intellectual flexibility, a, a metaphysical, um, you know, flexibility and, and and openness is just in the water and air. Um, now, in England, uh, you have the situation where, on the one hand, you've got, um, uh, you've, you've well, you've got the traditional astrologers who are very uh, strongly uh, rooted there. You've got, uh, you know, who, for whom, like going back to Lily uh, is a, a real um, paradigm setter. And then you've got uh, the Liz Green Jungian astrologers. And then you've got people uh, like Charles Harvey and John Addy who were very much thinking in terms of providing the metaphysical reunification of astrology with the with the with the Platonic uh, Pythagorean uh, worldview, so you've got these three different um, uh, orientations, and then you've got this new, uh, new in the last twenty years, which you're familiar with, coming from Jeffrey Cornelius, yeah. Maggie Hyde, um, and maybe now uh, Patrick Curry too, also very much coming into that uh, sphere. How I'll be, I'm so glad that your book is coming out uh, in the UK. Uh, and I'll be really interested, I'm, I'm interested from you and your sense right now of either I, hearing right now any um, sense of the reception there in that diverse uh, community uh, and uh, your sense of how it might be, your anticipation of how it might be received. I mean, Charles and, and John Addy are passed away, the, the, the great carriers of the platonic um, metaphysical school of astrology are, are, are not there now. So in a sense the, the postmodern uh, has the upper hand coming from Jeffrey Cornelius. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what your yeah. sense of it is now.